It, it's amazing. Andrology, even in uh, my short career, has, has changed a great deal. It's gone from being the ED clinic left for the SHO to do down the corridor with the dirty cameject injections, now to something where we're thinking about andrological health and how it can impact on other parts of your health. And thinking about uh, andrological symptoms as being the tremors that you may be able to influence to stop the earthquake. And I think we're really honored to have a fantastic panel today who are gonna talk about uh, how uh, andrological symptoms can be a barometer for general health. Um, so without ado, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Professor Andrea Salona, who is a professor of urology at Universita Vita Salute in San Rafael, and he's also the director of the Urological Research Institute. He's the deputy editor-in-chief of JSEX Med and part of the editorial board of European Urology. He's also the co-chair of the EAU Guidelines Panel on Male Sexual Dysfunction, and it's a real honor to have him with us today. Thank you very much. There are, first of all, good afternoon. There are several reasons for being in Liverpool the first reason for me is uh, this uh, Paul McCartney Carpool Karaoke. Whenever you had the chance to get a look there, please do that. That's emotional, as I used to say. And uh, I would love to, to thank uh, my dear friend Z for inviting me to deal with this concept, which is uh, quite close to research, the translational research I've done throughout the last 15 years, roughly. Why it is so important to consider infertility as a sort of uh, proxy of uh, overall men's health? Since uh, infertility per se has been considered as a disease, unfortunately not by the WHO, but the American Society for Reproductive Medicine has clearly defined the infertility condition as, as a disease. And uh, it is not a symptom, it is a disease, and this is important for us, being urologists, dealing with the concept of uh, men's health as a whole. I'm not an holistic person, but at the same time, it is very important to stress this point uh, at the beginning of my talk. As you know, last year, this data has been published dealing with the concept that throughout the last four decades, roughly, there was a sort of a decreased amount of, uh, in terms of sperm concentration, and the amount per se was decreased as much as uh, 50% as compared with 1973. It is not only important because this is strongly linked with uh, an increased difficulty in uh, uh, getting uh, pregnant uh, and so, to become a father. It is important since a decrease in terms of uh, sperm concentration is strongly associated both from the uh, statistical and the clinical standpoint to men's uh, overall health. Interestingly, last year at the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, it, they have been uh, producing data concerning a sort of sperm calculator, which is not important for dealing with the concept how many sperm we do have in semen, but it was important since they were able to sort of dichotomize the concept of a chronological age and biological age. That's meaning that in men suffering from infertility and coming to the office and seeking medical for couples infertility purposes, there was a sort of uh, discrepancy between the chronological age, 35 for instance, and the age of their own sperm, which was something like 45 a year, uh, or I would say roughly 10 years of difference, which is very important in terms of future uh, men's health condition. Interestingly, during the last uh, 15 years, I would say, we studied uh, a sort of common ground fostering both conditions. Thus meaning comorbid conditions, which are extremely common conditions, thus including diabetes mellitus, hypertension, uh, endocrinopathies, uh, metabolic syndrome, and the conditions of infertility, which is important because uh, both situations may impact, I would say negatively impact, toward the HPG axis, uh, spermatogenesis, and certainly toward men's health as a whole. Interestingly, we published the first study ever in 2009 where we used the Charleston Comorbidity Index, which is an index uh, useful from the statistical standpoint and the clinical as well, since uh, it is able to score comorbid conditions which after one year since diagnosis are able to promote death. This is important since uh, at that time uh, we used a Charleston Comorbidity Index which was established in 1987 where HIV infection was uh, scoring uh, six, which is not the case any longer, but at that time we were able to compare a cohort of men 
uh, came for infertility purposes, primary infertility, only white Caucasian, very homogeneous cohort, with a cohort of men with, uh, which, according to the WHO, were completely fertile persons. And what we found was that CCI was completely different from the statistical standpoint. And at the multivariate analysis, the higher the infertility condition, the higher the CCI score. Thus meaning men suffering from infertility were less healthy than fertile, uh, the fertile counterpart. It has been even the case for Michael Eisenberg, which is, uh, um, uh, who is currently the director of the reproductive program at Stanford University in California. He has been able to collect data from the California registry, and he was able to correlate uh, the number of uh, abnormalities in terms of sperm parameters and the number of uh, comorbid conditions. And therefore, the higher the number of sperm parameters alterations, the, al the higher the number of CCI, which is very important since, uh, once again, there was a holistic correlation between the two conditions, uh, thus uh, outlining the uh, reality of a on ground fostering both conditions. Even more important, there was a huge correlation between uh, the cardiovascular uh, health status and the sperm parameters alterations, which once again is probably the key point of the entire research we perform uh, during the last two decades, roughly. We m further published this data in uh, 2015. Eugenio uh, was a fellow of mine at that time. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, he published data dealing with uh, primary infertile patients, which, are, uh, which is very important since they are quite young. And both at the univariable and the multivariable analysis, we found that FSH, the higher the FSH, the lower the sperm concentration, and the higher the CCI, the higher the probability of having an unhealthy condition for men coming to the office and seeking medical help for infertility purposes, not for comorbid conditions, for infertility purposes. Even more important, if you try to translate all this data into reality and the real life setting, this data, which I'm going to present, comes from the EMA study, European Malaysian study a study where a number of uh, centers across Europe are able to follow a number of roughly 4,000 men, not patients, men, throughout last, uh, the last four decades, roughly. Interestingly, the age range was, uh, and it is now, between 40 and 80s. Well, the prevalence of metabolic syndrome was uh, one out of four, which means uh, roughly 25%. If you move to our population, primary infertile men, 10%, secondary infertile men, 12%. The prevalence are certainly lower. What is important, the median age at presentation is roughly two decades lower, which means that we have patients coming to the office for infertility purposes which uh, present a condition from the uh, health status standpoint which is completely unhealthy as a whole. Interestingly, we recently assessed the condition of prediabetes using the American Diabetes Association definition, which has been published in 2014. And what we found in primary white Caucasian men, once again, 15% of those uh, individuals were suffering from uh, prediabetes or had criteria suggested for prediabetes, uh, which was completely unknown. And interestingly, we applied this uh, uh, statistical methodology, which has been published by Andrew Vickers at Memorial to predict the net benefit uh, in order to perform preventive uh, medicine. And between 5% and 20%, there was a huge uh, st a significant um, net benefit in preventing those patients who actually had uh, criteria suggested for pre-diabetes uh, to prevent the development of further uh, diabetes uh, in the near after. Interestingly enough, this is the case even for hypertension. Men coming to the office for infertility purposes uh, do have, interestingly enough, a higher prevalence of uh, uh, hypertension. If you try to move this uh, to the real life setting, once again, we recently assessed the prevalence of hypertension in our cohort of patients, and uh, we found that roughly 7% of those men were suffering from uh, 
unknown hypertension or not well controlled hypertension. And if you get a look to the, uh, this is a cross-sectional study, so uh, we, we were not able to perform a predictors of, but at the same time, association are quite important in the real life setting. And if you get a look to the years, uh, the median age was certainly higher for those suffering from uh, hypertension, but even more important to me, the median age was 39, which is certainly two decades lower than the usual population coming to the office of GPs, I would say, suffering from hypertension, which is once again quite important. Cancer and oncology are even more than important. Indeed, uh, Tom Walsh, now at uh, Seattle University, used data coming from the California Registry of Cancer, and he was able to address the issue of uh, is infertility associated with a higher risk of having a testicular carcinoma? Well, it was the case. Comparing the number of expected cases versus the number of diagnosed cases, there was a huge difference between the two. And once again, there was an association between uh, having uh, a condition of infertility and having a an higher risk of testicular uh, cancer. Interestingly enough, uh, this data has been uh, confirmed in a number of different studies uh, later on. Uh, this is a meta-analysis which has been published uh, roughly 10 years ago supporting this issue. Even more important, do we have a translational reason for that. If you move to the testicular dysgenesis syndrome concept, which has been popularized by Skakebeck, uh, uh, I would say uh, 15 years or, uh, ago, roughly, there was a, a huge correlation from the biological standpoint between uh, having a normal versus an abnormal spermatogenesis and dealing with the concept of developing uh, inside to carcinoma or testicular carcinoma as well. And this is biology. It is not only epidemiology or statistics. Interestingly, we recently published this uh, paper dealing with the concept that testicular pulp is not sterile, as we were aware about the, the condition. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the condition of the most severe condition of infertility, which is uh, idiopathic non-obstructive azospermia, did present in our patients a dysbiosis, which is something really connected to inflammation on one side and cancerogenic uh, uh, pathways on the other side of the coin. Thus meaning, once again, we do have translational data supporting this kind of condition. Interestingly, all meta-analytic data would support the idea that azospermia per se is strongly associate, associated with a higher risk of having cancer. Uh, a 2.2 as a ratio has been uh, uh, popularized by Michael Eisenberg. Get a look to the different kind of tumors, not only testis cancer, but even prostate cancer, melanoma, colon cancer, hematopoietic uh, uh, neoplasias, which are quite uh, frequently reported in our population. Interestingly, they were able to promote a sort of timeline of uh, cancer development uh, across the lifespan. And interestingly enough, they started from uh, testicular cancer to come over to non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Is it of importance? If you try to sum up all these data I just presented, there are a few important um, sentences uh, to uh, stress. First, there is a huge correlation from the statistical standpoint between infertility and a higher risk of having cancer and a higher risk of having uh, metabolic disorders. Even more important, azospermia and the very low sperm concentration seems to be the most important risk factor for, the most important independent predictor for such a kind of unhealthy condition. And that's the reason why we follow a number of roughly 800 patients during the last 10 years. All those patients have been eva evaluated at our academic outpatient clinic uh, between 2003 and 2009, uh, and they have been followed yearly during this period of time, addressing them with a comprehensive medical history using the Charleston Comorbidity Index uh, on a yearly basis. And what we found was that, unfortunately, 10% of those gentlemen did report an increase in terms of CCI, thus meaning a decrease in terms of uh, overall men's health. Interestingly, the higher the value of CCI, the baseline, the lower the value of sperm concentration, thus meaning uh, azospermia, they were strongly associated 
associated with a higher risk of increasing the number of comorbid conditions throughout the follow-up period itself. Get a look to this condition which have been found. First of all, myocardial infarction, diabetes mellitus, cancer. This is very important, cancer in patients that uh, at the baseline were quite young, lower than 40 years of age, therefore quite unexpected uh, uh, events. Interestingly, these are the so-called estimates for the risk of health status worsening, thus including age higher than 35 uh, years of age, BMI, the higher the BMI, the higher the risk of having uh, an increase in terms of CCI, uh, FSH, 7.6 is not that high, but it's still quite close to being a primary uh, hypo hypogonadal. Therefore, it is quite important, azospermia, a length of infertility, which is uh, quite close to a, a, a real demographic drift. Interestingly, in the US, they published this data, suggesting that the higher the number of sperm parameters alterations, the higher the risk of death. And this is quite important. We are not talking about uh, an increased amount of comorbid conditions. We are, we are going to talk about uh, pass away situation, which are completely different and certainly uh, uh, much more severe. Interestingly, these are the curves. Once again, the higher the number of uh, uh, sperm alterations, the higher the probability of death uh, in a quite short uh, lifespan, which is roughly 10 uh, years uh, at the beginning. Finally, just to try and support the concept of a common ground fostering both conditions, unhealthy and uh, conditions and uh, infertility. I believe that we are close to address a sort of progeroid syndrome. Infertility per se could be considered as a progeroid syndrome. Indeed, the chronological age is completely different as compared with the biological age of our patients coming to the office for infertility purposes. We do have a genomic landscape at the ground, and the genomic landscape is quite important, meaning that probably they do have a lower amount of stem cells, thus including germ cells on one side side, and an epigenomic landscape on the other side of the coin with a number of comorbid conditions which could be linked with a, a faster, a greater senescence of the cells on one side, and a number of different pathways which are, uh, you know, uh, crossing uh, through the gene genomic landscape itself. Thank you so much for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the floor? And don't forget, you can also send in your questions via the app. Kevin, do we have a roving microphone by any chance? Absolutely fascinating talk. Really enjoyed it. So Thank you. to take it a step further, what other steps should we be doing in clinic when we see subfertile men? What would you do? What would you recommend that we should be doing that we're not? If you try and combine your question with the EAU guidelines, well, unfortunately, you should stop doing anything. Since the World Cup is not supporting you in uh, performing any kind of analysis. And this is a nightmare to my mind. Indeed, we are suggesting a patient should perform a comprehensive lab test assessment, thus including glucose, uh, glycated hemoglobin, testosterone, and so on, so on, so on. But if you get a look to EAU guidelines, they do not. And this is a key point in my mind. First, uh, a comprehensive medical history is compulsory. I used to start my every single visit, I would say every single office visit uh, for every single patient with a, a huge and boring comprehensive uh, medical history taking, which is important, even considering familiarity for uh, prostate cancer, testis cancer, bladder cancer, since uh, every single glands cancer is quite close to be much more frequently reported in these kind of patients, thus including breast cancer. I, I used to consider a, a breast assessment for every patient coming to the office for infertility purposes. Uh, therefore, from a very practical standpoint, we are considering every man with a medical history, a comprehensive physical examination, thus including a digital rectal examination and breast cancer and breast assessment. And from the lab test standpoint, every single patient is performing karyotype analysis, a, a quite comprehensive hormonal milieu profile, 
and at least they've been evaluated using a, a blood pressure assessment at least uh, two times whenever it is completely abnormal. Just ask one more. Yeah. Um, you, you're talking about arteriopaths. It's one of the one of your observations. Do you think the link is is not just? Do you think basically for many of said the, uh, the obstructive or sorry non-obstructive patients who don't really know what the etiology is? Do you think it could be arteriopathic in some of these patients as a reason? It just seems more than just coincidence that you, you have this this finding. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are still at the beginning of, uh, I, I, I hope, uh, a very brilliant future in this kind of research. And in my mind, my researchers at, at the lab, they are doing a lot of studies concerning, for instance, uh, the extracellular matrix, uh, which is quite important in these gentlemen, and the correlation between the extracellular matrix at the testicular level, at the uh, endothelial level, at the vessel level, which is very close very, very close. What we found, for instance, I did not present those, those data yet, but the extracellular matrix is uh, very close to the one uh, which has been uh, demonstrated for uh, a situation at the myocardial level after a myocardial infarction. Very close to each other. But unfortunately or fortunately, those gentlemen did not have any kind of infarction at the testicular level. You know what? Uh, there is a, a completely uh, modified uh, ratio between collagen type 1 and type 4, which is very important in order to say these testes, uh, ex, uh, and this is particularly true for those suffering from non-obstructive azospermia, they are not able to grasp sperm, and therefore uh, it, it is sort of, you know, uh, I wait for sperm to go away. And since uh, the modification of this ratio of collagens is completely unhealthy, and this is unhealthy uh, at the level of the testes, it is unhealthy at the level of the, uh, of the herd, it is unhealthy everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? I've, I've got a quick question, which is yeah. um, uh, about taking the opportunity to do investigations exactly as you say, m maybe thinking about doing a metabolic screen as we do now on patients who have ED. But one of the things that worries me the most is so many patients with infertility don't get seen by urologists, they get seen by gynecologists. I'm not sure if that's what happens in the rest of Europe, that's certainly what happens in the UK. And just the simplest thing of examining the testicle, just to be able to spot a possible malignancy. Uh, I was talking to Kevin yesterday, in fact, we were saying how in, just in the last 12 months we've had two patients who have been under uh, fertility clinics for 12 months with infertility with no examination of their scrotum. And talking about guidelines on what should be introduced, I mean, we almost need to have some pan speciality guideline to, to recommend these things? I'm trying to answer your question uh, with a vice versa condition. If you get a look to our guidelines, uh, I mean the EAU guidelines, they always stress the issue that both partners uh, of a couple who is uh, coming to the office for infertility purposes should be evaluated at the same time, which is not the case for OBGYN specialists. Unfortunately, I would say unfortunately, Reproductive medicine is a rich field. And uh, this is the case, at least in my country, for gynecologists. They are doing babies only using the a female part of the coin. And uh, we are only sperm, which is not the case, uh, fortunately, in my academic hospital uh, from, the, from the urological perspective. But it is true. In Italy, it is certainly true. But it, it has been the experience I had throughout uh, you know, uh, uh, Europe as well. On the other side of the coin, our own guidelines, they do not stress the issue that paternal age is important. They stress the issue that women age is important. They do not stress the point that paternal age is important. And we do have data telling us that the older the uh, um, paternal age at presentation at first seeking medical help, the higher the probability of uh, not getting pregnancy, nothing concerning live birth, and then higher risk of uh, you know, disorders for offsprings. That's including uh, trisomy 21, uh, schizophrenia, uh, autism status, uh, achondroplasia, a lot of them. But we do not stress, and that's the reason why I would really stress the issue that both partners should be comprehensively evaluated. Thank you very much, I agree. And I think it should be the, the norm, not the exception, which is what happens at the moment. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Moving on to our next speaker, Mr. Parnham from Manchester. Uh, he's got an extensive uh, andrological practice, uh, including penile cancer, and he's written a number of European guidelines on the committee. Over to you. Thanks very much.
So, uh, as I've uh, introduced, my name is Ari Panam. I'm a consultant at the Christie's in Manchester. Um, and I've been tasked to talk to you today about endothelial dysfunction and PD5 inhibitor use, cardiovascular risk, health, and mortality risk. So, as with all great stories, a good start at the beginning. Um, and we know that this really came to the front when we had the male, uh, Massachusetts male aging study, uh, which is looking at cross sectional um, of 40 to 70 year olds and found approximately 50% of those had erectile dysfunction. Uh, leading on from that, there was a study or a publication by O'Kane who reported on two patients, and this is really kind of the kind of initial part and then subsequently commented on by Kirby. And essentially, these two patients presented as thus. The first patient had um, a heart attack, um, and then on direct questioning when asking further about it, he told us that, uh, well, he told the, uh, the investigators that two months prior, he developed erectile dysfunction. The second patient, slightly different, had erectile dysfunction from the start, but multiple comorbidities which are associated with cardiovascular risks, such as smoking, obesity, diabetes, went for an angiogram and was found to have three-vessel disease. This study here by von Torsi kind of reinforces the message, really, and basically this was looking at two centres, uh, patients who presented that with a heart attack, um, then went on to have angiography. And those that had stenosis less than, uh, sorry, uh, more than 50% were then questioned, and 49% of those were found to have erectile dysfunction. And that erectile dysfunction predated that coronary event by 38.8 months, well, let's say three years. So the question was, why is that? And this is some data here by Montours and uh, Andrea was involved in that as well, which is uh, this artery size hypothesis based, in, based on the fact that all the vascular endothelium are um, exposed to the same amount of degradation, but due to the size of the vessels, and in the case penile artery vessels being one to two millimeters, compared to coronary artery vessels, actually they only become symptomatic um, uh, later on. So in other words, uh, penile artery, when it gets 50% stenosed, you'll find that a coronary artery will probably be only about a third stenosed. Reinforcing this, this is actually earlier data, which is interesting, back in 1997. This was um, looking at, the, again, the association of ED and cardiac disease. And again, looking at um, patients who had angiography, they looked at 40 patients. They um, administered a questionnaire one day beforehand. It was an O'Leary questionnaire, so it wasn't your IIEF, but it'll do. Um, and it was looking at number of uh, sexual, oh, sorry, number of erections in 30 days, the firmness and difficulties in, in achieving the erection. And you can see here between two vessel disease and three de vessel disease, there is a halving in all of these. So, you know, the number of uh, erections in day went from 2.1 to 1.2, firmness 2.7 to 1.2, and difficulties in achieving 3.0 to 1.8. All of these were statistically significant on the analysis. So the question is, well, what's kind of going on here? Well, we can see some of the risk factors here that associated cardiovascular disease, such as centripetal obesity, smoking, sedentary lifestyle, diabetes, uh, poor diet, and hypercholesterolemia, all part of what we now term something along the lines of a metabolic syndrome, a pro-inflammatory type of condition. And this pro-inflammatory, this kind of metabolic syndrome is having an effect on the endothelium. And I suppose the question really derives out of that, well, what is the endothelium? What does it do? Well, Vane calls it the largest uh, vascular, sorry, vascular organ in its own right. And basically, it is involved in hemostasis, fibrinolysis, regulation of vascular tone, regulation of permeability, and synthesis of growth factors. All of this, though, is mediated by nitrous oxide, and that was basically came out of work by Fergot, Nignar, and Murad, who won a Nobel Prize as a result of that. And nitrous oxide has the following properties of antithrombotic um, properties, anti-apoptotic, antioxidant, and anti-inflammatory. So how are these conditions really impacting upon the mechanisms of endothelial dysfunction? This is a slide taken from the American Diabetes Association. It's quite simplistic, but it's quite neat in explaining it. And we all recognize part of this, which is the first bit, which is the L-arginine going to nitrous oxide through ENOS. But insulin resistance um, affects ENOS, reduces the amount of it. Um, asymmetric dimethyl arginine, which is an endogenous inhibitor as a result of the insulin um, inhibitor, sorry, insulin resistance, also affects the BH4, which is a cofactor in NOS and the conversion of L-arginine to nitrous oxide. Hypoglycemia also increases the number of reactive oxygen species, uh, as well as uh, free fatty acids doing a similar type of action. So you can see there's a multiple uh, faceted or multiple roles that uh, lead to the uh, reduction in nitrous oxide. So what do we have available that may help with this? Well, we have 
PD-5 inhibitors. And the first one of these uh, PD-5 inhibitors, obviously we all recognize it as sildenafil um, or Viagra. Um, and that was uh, obviously devised uh, by Pfizer um, and licensed in 1998 for uh, erectile dysfunction, having been repurposed from originally being a cardiac disease uh, modifying medication, and also in 2005 for pulmonary hypertension. The mechanism of action for most of us will recognize this. This is smooth muscle cells here, and you've got uh, granulated cyclates um, being converted, using, sorry, converting GTP to cyclic GMP. Uh, then um, increasing PKG and causing uh, efflux of calcium out of your uh, smooth muscle cell, leading to smooth uh, muscle relaxation, all under the mediation of PD-5. So obviously your PD-5 inhibitor prevents that, increases your cyclic GMP, uh, increases the role of your PKG access and causes further efflux and relaxation. This slightly complicated diagram, and I apologize for the complicated nature of it, goes into this a little bit further. So actually PD-5 has other roles on top of that. So you may recognize number one, which is the uh, first part of that, that's the, um, the regulation of cyclic GMP there, and obviously that will increase that as we've talked about already. But as you can see by the other numbered figures, it also has other roles. So if you look at the L-arginine bit, conversion to nitrous oxide through ENOS, ENOS obviously being uh, stimulated by a shear, uh, shear stress, acetylcholine, and maybe angiotensin 1 to 7, um, is also uh, inhibited by PD5A. And Trinity Baklava's group uh, looked at that and noted that by uh, inhibiting that PD5A with sildenafil, you actually uh, increase the amount of nitrous oxide and moved it away from that ENOS and coupling and the um, increase in reactive oxygen species as circled in red. Sildenafil may also affect the NADPH oxidase and again reducing reactive oxygen species. And then a further role also, there may be um, going back to the angiotensin 1 and 7 in the top left hand corner there, sildenafil is thought to inhibit um, the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme, moving the pathway away from the NADPH oxidase and moving again towards the ENOS production, hopefully improving your endothelial function. And this summarizes, this is two parts of it. You've got the uh, vascular, sorry, the renal artery or uh, renal hypertension um, causing an increase in NADPH. We talked about reactive species, a reduction in prostaglandins, which causing vasodilation, EDHF, and nitrous oxide. And these have effects of hypertension, cardiac hypertrophy, DNA damage, and apoptosis. But sildenafil mitigates against all of these. And the same with atherosclerosis. So, can we find anything that translates this data or this kind of theory that actually PD-5 inhibitors may have an effect upon cardiovascular risk? Well, this is a study by Hutchins. This is data um, from uh, the northwest of England, actually, looking at um, 5,956 uh, 5, patients with type 2 diabetes, high-risk disease as well, for high risk for cardiovascular disease. And they followed up from 7.5 years. And looking back at the GP data, they found around about a quarter of these were taking a PD-5 inhibitor. They were able to find out things like age, obviously, BMI, HbA1c, creatinine, glucose, cholesterol, HDL, LDL, triglycerides, and be able to use these later on. And here are some of the uh, data from that. So this is looking um, at particularly diabetes with and without PD5 inhibitors on overall uh, all-cause mortality. And as you can see, this is reduced by 46%, as it has a ratio of 0.54, statistically significant. So in this group, it would appear, although there are limitations of this, I admit, because this is a cross-sectional study, um, that this is making an improvement. Also, if you look at people who have had a previous MI and a PD5 inhibitor as well, they were able to look at that. And that also reduced the death in these group of patients by 39%. So again, statistically significant. If you looked at de novo or new uh, presentations with heart attacks, again, those that weren't on PD-5 inhibitors, there was a rate of 8.5%, while those that were on PD-5 inhibitors, there was only 5.2% uh, presenting with new heart attacks. And if you take that particular group out, again, if you look at PD-5 inhibitors, which they were able to pick out, that lowered the risk of uh, all-cause mortality again by 40%. 
But is this just isolated da uh, data? Is this just the, the Northwest being specifically uh, on its own? Well, actually, it's collaborated by uh, other data. This is a Swedish registry here. This is by Anderson, same um, name, different person. Um, looking at people who presented um, and with heart attacks, again, between 2007 and 2013, and there are 42,145 patients. And they looked at those that were taking PD-5 inhibitors, very similar to the last one, and those that weren't. And this is what they found. So those with PD-5 inhibitors, the uh, rate of death was or mortality all cause was 3.7 versus those that weren't taking PD-5 inhibitors, 12%. That's quite a remarkable difference in that sense. And also, if you look at the heart attack rate, 3.5 versus 7.7, a doubling in those that are not taking PD-5 or half, depending on the way you look at it. And also, the rate of heart failure was significantly lower in those that were taking PD-5 inhibitors. So let's consider each one of those in turn, heart failure and heart attacks. So the data actually out there for heart failure would suggest that actually only uh, heart failure with uh, reduced ejection fraction, that's an ejection fraction less than 50%, seem to be benefiting from PD-5 inhibitors. And we can see in the studies for these people, they're getting LV remodeling. Well, this isn't replicated in those patients with preserved eje um, uh, uh, ejection fractions. And we're not quite sure why that is. So if we look at those with the reduced ejection fractions, well, there's lots of different reasons why PD-5 inhibitors may be making a difference. The first is cardiac remodeling. And there is a study by Takemoto who looked at uh, rats, and he basically tied off or reduced the uh, diameter of their aortas and then uh, left them on a PD-5 inhibitor for a couple of weeks and then examined their hearts and noticed that those that were on PD-5 inhibitors or given PD-5 inhibitors had uh, less LV dysfunction and also had no, uh, notable signs of remodeling. There's also improved diastolic functioning. That comes back to that nitrous oxide pathway of relaxation and so on and so forth. And the reduction of interstitial fibrosis as well, talking about the reduction of those reactive oxygen species. Pulmonary vasodilation is also another part, reducing the preload um, on the left ventricle and uh, afterload on the right ventricle. So also helping a little bit with the cardiac function. And also improving cardiac microcirculation uh, as well. The same kind of thing is seen in MI as on the same, along the same lines. So the cardio effects can be classified, uh, sorry, can be classified as cardio effects or vascular effects. And the cardio effects are things like reduced apoptosis, increased mitochondrial function, reduced ventricular arrhythmias, reduced infarct size, and systolic, increased systolic function. While the vascular effects are things like coronary artery vasodilation, so improved uh, perfusion, and reduced afterload. So the question is, when we look back at that original data by Hutchins, and saw that mortality rate difference. Why was that? Well, some of that data explains it. But actually, if we look at people who are having heart attacks, what is the most common cause of death in these patients? Well, actually, around about 50% of them die from some sort of uh, arrhythmia. So here's um, a study that's actually unpublished at the moment, and it's just going through, but this is looking at sildenafil applied to sheep um, who uh, essentially are given dofertilin, um, which induces... Uh, a type of uh, arrhythmia. This is a torsars de point for those of you who ever remember cardiology. Um, and then they were then administered sildenafil. And you can see that once the uh, sildenafil is administered, those uh, torsars de point uh, seem to be abolished. So maybe this is a role in reducing that um, mortality rate. I'm not quite sure, but this is data that's um, very early on. And here you can see the VT episodes are reduced as a consequence. So PD-5 inhibitors seem to have a significantly expanding role, and certainly you can see across the diseases, you've got neurological disease where this may have a role. You may have uh, bladder dysfunction, certainly evidence coming out there as well, renal disease, heart failure. We already know about erectile dysfunction, but the point is it seems to have far-reaching effects beyond what we traditionally used to remember as erections and hearts. So to summarize, ED and cardiovascular disease are part of the same process. And ED seems to predict cardiovascular disease. The role of nitrous oxide and PD-5 is critical in endothelial function. And there's an expanding role for PD-5 inhibitors. Well, yeah, this is yet to be defined, I guess. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. An excellent presentation. Any questions from the audience? CJ. Can I just... Ask over here. Yeah, so gentlemen, Sorry. As a urologist with this much interest, how far do you go with your cardiology investigations or are you referring all of your men to cardiologists for, for testing 
if they've got ED? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And actually, most of that's set out in guidelines, isn't it? So if you look at the Princeton 2 criteria, most of us would adhere to that. That seems a fairly sensible way of approaching things, doesn't it? So people who have got you know, recent MI or aren't meeting the metabolic equivalence, so in other words, if they can't run up a flight of stairs or if they can't walk, you know, there's a quarter of a mile, isn't it, which is about two metabolic equivalents. Those are the guys that we should be targeting, isn't it? Also, if you've got multiple risk factors, most of us can do that. I think most of that's part of our basic ED history, isn't it, an examination. So I think, realistically, it's a risk-stratified approach. I think if you were to send all the ED patients off to your cardiologist, you probably, well, probably wouldn't do anything else. But yeah, I think it's a risk-stratified approach, and that's what I would do in that circumstance. CJ. All right, that's an excellent presentation. Um, I've just got sort of two parts yeah, to the great, question. Yeah. The first is some of the data you showed, like how it modulates the effect on reactive oxygen species, is rather than on a transcriptional level, it's more on the chemical, uh, so whether it's nitric oxide, etc. So sildenafil, and these are in vitro studies, so sildenafil has a short half-life. Mm. In other words, my question for you, uh, and for pulmonary hypertension, they were using a TDS. So. It just biologically doesn't make sense to me unless whether there was any description of whether the, the mortality or outcomes were stratified or separated by the longer acting ones or not. Uh, well, the data doesn't seem to, well, the data that I've seen in any case on it doesn't seem to stratify by the type of PD5 inhibitor. Actually, most of that data is did they take a PD5 inhibitor? at some point, uh, especially that Hutchins data, the one from the Northwest, that actually was, the criteria was, have they taken a single dose or more? So, you know, it's very difficult to determine. Which, which so is what you, was going to bring me on to my second point, in that in drawing conclusions that uh, PD-5 inhibitors do improve your uh, mortality, or set, say, or control of diabetics, one might argue, actually, it's the guys who are taking PD-5 inhibitors who are health conscious, looking to look after themselves, who are probably getting better diabetic control so how do you separate that effect? I'm just trying to... Yeah, well, I, I agree with you, CJ. That's the criticism of that study, isn't it, realistically? So the problem is, is that, as you quite rightly identified, people who are taking PD-5 inhibitors are by nature probably requested it because they want to be sexually active, probably are healthier, so probably going to survive longer. So you can't pick that data out, not yet in any case. But as I suppose with time goes on, we might be able to. Just one question, just, the, just a question from the... Um uh, the online thing, which I think follows on from CJ's question, which is, should we all be on uh, Tadalafil five milligrams once a day? I'm tempted to start taking it once I get home, even though I don't have ED, which I think is a, a very relevant question. Can I just uh, answer that question? Yeah. The, uh, the Swedish study actually did show that there was a dose relationship. The more doses you took, the lower the risk. And also that the dose that you need to improve endothelial function is about one-tenth of the dose that you need to get an erection. And yes, you're right, we should all be taking Tadalafil five milligrams a, a day. <laughs> but unfortunately, the NHS have blacklisted it. Yeah, it won't stretch to yeah. that, I don't think, not yet. Talk about um, uh, having uh, the andrological triple therapy when you hit 50 of starting a statin, metformin, and Cialis five milligrams once a day. That's my kind of cocktail. Yeah. Yeah. Final question, gentlemen in the uh, blue shirt. From clinical perspective, would you consider 5 milligram, 20 milligram, and what is a daily dose, PRN dose, what is it? And is there a data suggestive at 20 milligram as what the gentleman said, that it is beneficial, but how would it relate or transcribe clinically? Straightforward answer is I don't think I, I don't really know. I don't know if you've got any impression on that, uh, Jeff, about that exactly. But uh, I don't think there's enough data out there to we, suggest. We have a protocol in for a randomised controlled clinical trial on five milligrams a day, running for five years. So for those who are only impressed by double-blind placebo controlled studies, come back in five or six years. We'll answer that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Thank you. Now, now, moving on to our next speaker, Professor Hackett, who's already started some of his uh, talk already. Uh, he doesn't need much of an introduction. A very entertaining speaker, speaks at a number of meetings, and has a clinical practice in Birmingham. Over right. to you. Thank you very much in, indeed. Uh, I'm going to talk on uh, the effects of testosterone replacement therapy, long-term morbidity and mortality. What is the evidence? And this is the ultimate poison chalice. We were talking about guidelines earlier, and I'd just like to commend these excellent guidelines which will give the answer to most of the questions you've been asked. Uh, 
published by the uh, British Society for Sexual Medicine in the last six months, all free to download from the BSSM website. Now, when you wait 10 years for some guidelines, they're like London buses. They come along and, and very quickly on top, we had the Androgen Society guidelines and we had the AUA guidelines on testosterone deficiency. So there was a rather a, a, a glut of guidelines all at once. But just one uh, uh, taste that I'd like to give you from the AUA guidelines is they, for the first time, made this statement, uh, Advice 13. Clinicians should infer, uh, inform testosterone deficient patients that low testosterone is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And this is the first time this has been put in. So it's an independent risk factor. So not measuring it or ignoring it puts your patients at increased risk, and you should be telling patients that they're at increased risk from their low testosterone. Around the same time, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, in their guidelines on obesity, came up with the following advice. They recommended that all men who have increased waist circumference, and in America, that's 102 centimeters, they get a nice, generous extra eight centimeters before they become obese or who have a BMI of greater than 30 should have their testosterone measured. Uh, all male patients with type 2 diabetes should be evaluated to exclude testosterone deficiency. You could go to a two-day diabetes meeting in this country and the word testosterone will not be mentioned once in the entire meeting. And also, they recommend that men with hypogonadism and obesity who are not seeking fertility should be considered for testosterone therapy in addition to lifestyle change because testosterone therapy results in weight loss, decreased waist circumference, and improvement in metabolic parameters, glucose, HbA1c, lipids, and blood pressure, grade A evidence. Fairly strong comments. Now, just to bring home this message about low testosterone being bad news, this was a meta-analysis from Haring when he looked at all the massive studies that had been done that showed that if you had a low testosterone, you died earlier. And if you look at model four across the bottom, what you can see is that uh, where they took the, um, uh, the, uh, the cutoff points here, all the studies had different cutoffs for what they considered hypogonadism. And the lower the testosterone that they took, uh, the higher the degree of risk of death. So in fact, there was a remarkable consistency in all these what, call, what seemed to be random studies. And here's a study from Scandinavia pub published uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, look at this, 5,300 men followed up for 29 years. You can't do that too often. And what this showed that, that uh, it's put the other way around, that if you had higher test total testosterone, it protected you from getting diabetes. So if you had low testosterone, you had a three to four fold risk of getting type 2 diabetes. And also having a low SHBG increased your risk of type 2 diabetes. And these risks were blunted if you smoked, because obviously smoking uh, on its own was a significant risk. Now, what are the mechanisms by which giving testosterone to replace uh, 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 low testosterone levels might in some way uh, uh, create a problem with increased cardiovascular risk? Most of this comes from data related to anabolic steroid abusers, where they can be at risk of myocardial hypertrophy, transient hypertension, an increased prothrombotic state, increased vascular reactivity, uh, a lower uh, HDL level, and uh, postulated an increasing risk of, of, of uh, arrhythmia. But on the other side, uh, you know, what we do know is that testosterone is an excellent uh, treatment for anemia because hypogonadism is a cause of anemia. It's on the list of, of anemia. And so testosterone replacement will stimulate erythropoietin production by the kidneys and also uh, directly and by conversion to estradiol, it uh, decreases the hepcidin level and increases iron availability and the ability to incorporate iron into hemoglobin. So two mechanisms 
by which it can increase the hemoglobin and hematocrit. But what are the mechanisms by which testosterone might reduce cardiovascular risk? Well, if, if it reduces fat mass and it increases muscle mass, this will uh, be beneficial in terms of uh, fitness, ability to exercise. It will lower insulin resistance. Uh, there, there is an effect from the weight loss and the increase of muscle of reducing lipids. It's a vasodilator. If you give testosterone to somebody, uh, it, it has about the, a similar effect to a calcium channel blocker. It reduces inflammation, and several studies have shown inflammatory markers are reduced. And of course, there's that effect on insulin resistance. So what's the, the real evidence that testosterone therapy is beneficial? A quick uh, mention of the T trial, which we waited for years, 790 patients, seven overlapping studies, testosterone uh, gel versus placebo, one year follow-up, randomized uh, placebo control, double blind. What did they show? Significant improvement in sexual activity, IIEF scores occurring very promptly. Increased walking distance for patients on a six-minute walking test, 32%. Uh, could walk an extra 50 meters on their six-minute walking test. A great improvement for frail elderly people. And that improvement seemed to be increasing with time. So the conclusions were sexual function, improved physical function. It improved mood and energy, less bad mood and depression, corrected anemia, improved bone density by 6.8%, safe compared with placebo, no uh, increased prostate cancer, no increased cardiovascular uh, uh, events, but uh, a cardiovascular element of the study was reported as showing a, a, uh, uh, an increase in non-calcific plaque of uncertain significance. But it was a very strange study because the placebo arm had two and a half times the plaque burden of the active treatment at baseline. So it's a, 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 a very uh, odd study, but there were no cardiovascular events. Now, in Birmingham, uh, we, we published the BLAST study some years ago, which was the largest double-blind placebo-controlled study exclusively in type 2 diabetes using either long-acting testosterone or placebo. And what we showed, as you can see here, is that versus placebo, that the testosterone lowered the HbA1c, they lost weight, their BMI fell modestly, their waist circumference fell modestly, their total cholesterol fell modestly, their erectile function score improved, their symptomatic uh, uh, AMS score improved, and that in a one-year open-label extension, all those parameters continued to improve. And I just challenge you to look at the improvement in their EF score if they were taking a PD-5 inhibitor as well, 9.5 points. But we followed these patients up when we'd screened 857 patients from seven practices to get out 200 for the study. We were left with uh, roughly equal numbers who were eugonadal, who had low testosterone, who didn't enter the study, and those who entered the study. And we followed them up for five years. And this is the mortality. As you can see, uh, not surprisingly, those who un had untreated hypogonadism, 19.7% died within the next four years versus 13% of the eugonadal. Only 3.6% of those treated died. And there are the absolute numbers, four out of 110. Now, it's difficult when you've been following these patients up for 10 years to think that some form of armor, uh, of androgenic Armageddon is coming to these men when the ones that you didn't treat are all dying and the ones you've treated have still survived. Now, you'll notice at the top it says men not receiving PDE5 inhibitors. You'll think, because we knew by that stage that PDE5 in inhibitors independently reduced risk, as I'll go on to in a moment. So what we published in the World Journal of, of, of Diabetes was the age-related probability of dying, and, and in the red, you have uh, the uh, uh, low testosterone untreated, and in the blue, the effect of treating with testosterone. As you can see, there's a reduced probability of dying at all ages, more marked the older that you get. 
But look what happens, and this answers the chairman's question, if you take a statin and a PD-5 inhibitor. Look at the blue line at the bottom. Virtually nobody died. Um, uh, we were struggling to find deaths if you were taking testosterone, a PD-5 inhibitor, and a statin as well. So what's all the fuss about? I, unfortunately, we have to mention this vegan study that you probably uh, have heard Abe Morgenthaler uh, trash so often and eff effectively. Unfortunately, this was, was published in JAMA, and it caused the FDA to put a warning. Now, if you know anything about this study, you know that actually what it showed was that the absolute number of events on testosterone therapy was actually lower uh, than, than it was on the untreated group. But because they did some strange statistics involving a multivariate analysis of Kaplan-Meier propensity weighted data, which I've never seen in a paper before, they got a different conclusion. But they also, in their data, excluded 1,100 people who had an event and then got put on testosterone afterwards, which is a very strange way of doing things. When they were challenged on this, they did a recount, and they came up and said, actually, that number should only have been 128, but what's 1,000 patients in a study? That's not significant, it really, is it? And, by the way, 104 of them were women, but um, that didn't seem to make any difference. So since then, several longitudinal studies were published that all tended to show either no increased risk uh, with testosterone therapy, or indeed uh, a slight benefit. Let's just have a look at a couple of these, because these were the ones that were done quite well. This one by Anderson actually looked at when you gave testosterone, whether the testosterone therapy did cause a normalization of testosterone level. And what they showed is that those patients who were followed up who had a, continued to have a low testosterone, and you'll see that 14% of that, those were actually treated, but effectively were being undertreated. There were 72 events. Uh, there were only 37 in those who were treated into the upper range. And at three years, that benefit of achieving normal range of testosterone was still seen. And this study by Wallace, a Canadian study, actually looked at the duration of study, not the levels achieved, and they showed that uh, after you treated for longer than two years, not only that was there a significant reduction in mortality and cardiovascular events, but there was a 40% reduction in new cases of prostate cancer, which was a very interesting finding uh, in relation to other studies. So whenever you want the answer to a, a question on this, you always look for a corona meta-analysis. There'll always be one on any difficult subject you want. So he looked at the cardiovascular risk associated with testosterone therapy. And what did he find? The problem here is that these studies, the mean duration was only 32 weeks. This isn't long enough because randomized control studies were usually done for 12 weeks or a maximum of six months. So they're not simply not long enough to determine long-term cardiovascular risk or benefit. But despite that, they showed that there was an increase in cardiovascular events in men with metabolic disease. Even with that short period of time, in the high-risk men with metabolic disease, the testosterone caused a reduction in all-cause mortality and cardiovascular events. Here's a cardiology review from uh, Bob Cloner in the American Journal of Cardiology. He showed exactly the same thing, cardiovascular uh, reduction with testosterone therapy. And thank you very much indeed. Pleased to have some questions. Very informative talk. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it precipitate quite a few questions. I've already seen what we've got. We've just literally got two minutes. Quick question. I'm Mark Lucky from Liverpool. Um, fantastic talk, as always. Um, one of the groups I struggle with are the obese men, BMI maybe 35 or 40 and over, with borderline low testosterone, um, less than 7. I'm always a bit reticent, especially with the incre increased theoretical issues with prostate cancer, so to prescribe replacement testosterone in this group 
versus try them on weight loss to see if their testosterone recovers. I was just wondering what your thoughts are on this group of patients. Well, I, I don't see it as an either or. Uh, I, I do both. Uh, because according to the guidelines, that patient should be treated because I'm sure they'll be highly symptomatic. They'll almost certainly have erectile dysfunction that probably even, is not responding. borderline low testosterone? Well, I wouldn't call seven borderline low. Okay. Uh, because we could talk about uh, reference ranges from labs uh, versus action levels. Because reference ranges for labs, those of you who don't know, they get 100 normal people in the population. And the 2.5% that are at the top and the bottom are regarded as the abnormal. Now, we don't do that for any other condition. You don't only, uh, you're not only interested in the top 2.5% of PSAs. You base your, your action on evidence-based action levels. So reference ranges we ought to throw out the window and use um, you know, evidence-based um, action levels. So I, I would treat that patient to be symptomatically uh, every single time okay. and and weight loss as well okay unfortunately i think we've run out of time so we haven't got mid time for any more questions but but thank you very much everyone and uh, for a brilliant talk from our panel panelists thank you <laughs>